A big thanks to all the people who requested Nine Inch Nails. Also, a big shout out to my new patrons, Kevin Gold, John Cope, Corey Clark, and Volksgeist. One of you guys seem oddly familiar. Trent Reznor is yet another renaissance man of rock music. He's most famous for running Nine Inch Nails, but over the years he has branched out to doing film scores, starting his own label, and doing various side projects. But the man who created one of the darkest and most outstanding industrial albums of all time is far from finished. His new album Bad Witch is just around the corner, and just like with his previous albums, it seems like Trent is leading his fans into yet another cryptic and dark soundscape. Let's take a closer look. Michael Trent Reznor was born on May 17, 1965 to parents Nancy Lou and Michael Reznor. He grew up in Mercer, Pennsylvania and lived much of his childhood with his maternal grandparents after his parents divorced. His grandfather recalled that Trent started playing piano when he was 12 and also had interest for building model planes and skateboarding. He was never the most outgoing kid, and his sense of isolation might be the thing that inspired him to dive deeper into music. He also had a desire to travel and explore the rest of the world as he grew up in a very, very small town. As he said in an interview, it wasn't a bad place where I grew up, but there was nothing going on but the cornfields. My life experience came from watching movies, watching TV, and reading books and magazines. Throughout school, he was very proactive in both music and acting. In high school, he joined a jazz and marching band, learned to play the saxophone and tuba, and he was also voted the best in drama for his role as Judas in the school play Jesus Christ Superstar. It was at high school that Trent started joining his first independent bands as well. He was a part of a lot of different bands, most notably Slam Bamboo, but all of these bands were very short-lived, and maybe that's a good thing. Now, what helped Reznor get a more stable role in music was his first job as an assistant engineer and janitor at Cleveland's Right Track Studio. He was allowed to record his own music in the studio's spare time, which resulted in a few of his early demos. He played all the instruments himself except for the drums, and this habit became a part of the usual creative process for the following Nine Inch Nails albums. Trent stood for most and sometimes all of the creative work, while when it came to touring, that's when he decided to put a band together. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roadhouse is proud to welcome the Nine Inch Nails. Talking about Nine Inch Nails, Trent started the project in 1988 and released his first album Pretty Hate Machine the next year. He's released 8 albums over the past 30 years with this project, and his most essential album out of these is probably The Downward Spiral from 94. The album that has been criticized for bordering on the satanic portrays endeavors and overindulgence with sex, drugs, and destructive thoughts that ultimately leads the main character in the lyrics to disbelief in God, megalomania, and ultimately suicide. The lyrics are filled with this otherworldly sort of hatred, and the industrial rock music enhances that to the extreme. Where all of this anger was coming from isn't really clear to say, but Trent managed to call it forth in one way or another to make one of the most outstanding albums of the 90s. There are many elements that inspired Trent to make this album, but there's one thing in particular that inspired him more than anything else. As he said in an interview, I got into Bowie in the Scary Monsters era, and then I picked up Low and instantly fell for it. I related to it on a songwriting level, a mood level, and on a song structure level. The links between Bowie and Trent are so many that we could make a whole video about that in itself, but for now, I think it's fair to say that he was a major influence on Trent, both artistically and career-wise. With the release of his early albums, Trent was largely responsible for popularizing the industrial rock genre and bringing it to the mass market. Closer was being played by the same DJs that played Madonna, 
trans combination of pop, electronic, and rock music managed to bring this underground genre into the mainstream for a brief time. He definitely managed to create a unique movement with this type of music, although there were several examples of bands with an industrial sound before him, like Throbbing Gristle, Skinny Puppy, Ministry, and others. Trent certainly got a lot of attention with his poppy industrial sound, but what solidified his fanbase over the years was his ability to create concept albums, art that stretched way beyond the music into virtual reality games, secret shows, and more something I elaborated on in this video. But Nine Inch Nails is only one of Trent's many musical projects. In 2009, he formed another group called How to Destroy Angels, with his longtime collaborator Atticus Ross, his wife, Mara Queen Manding, and Rob Sheridan. With their two EPs and one full-length album, they explored much of the same territory as Nine Inch Nails did, but with a lot less anger involved. Their music is certainly softer, especially with Mary Queen on vocals, but melodically and lyrically they still visit some very dark and grim places. Trent noted in an interview that it felt interesting to work with four people as a band, with all the members being equally included in the creative process. The reason why he thought this was a good thing to do was because he had a meaningful experience working on the film score for David Fincher's film Gone Girl. He really seemed to enjoy the collaborative work here and the fact that he could serve other people in a creative project that wasn't necessarily his own. Now, talking about films, he's done a lot of film music over the years. Some of the projects he's been involved with include Natural Born Killers, Lost Highway, Tetsuo the Bullet Man, Before the Flood, and perhaps more famously for The Social Network, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and Gone Girl. But Trent's interest for films doesn't stop at the soundboard. Back in 2007, he was planning to create his own miniseries. This was right after he had released Year Zero with Nine Inch Nails, an album with a very meticulously created post-apocalyptic concept. The idea was that the series would tell a story based on the concept played out in Year Zero. But unfortunately, the project never came to fruition as Trent never seemed to find the right writer for it. Now, after years of being under the influence of other labels with Nine Inch Nails, he eventually decided to start his own record label, The Null Corporation. This led him to release all his albums with even more artistic freedom. All the releases of Nine Inch Nail material have interestingly enough been put into a system of numbers and labels over the years. Halo numbers are the numbers assigned to pieces of the Nine Inch Nails discography in the order that they were released. There are other promotional releases that are given seed numbers and other Trent Reznor related releases from the Null Corporation that are given null numbers. This system was actually inspired by the Depeche Mode who had a similar number system for their releases. It's a system made with the intention of making it easier for collectors to keep track of their collection. Now there's a lot of buzz around Nine Inch Nails these days, since they're about to release their new album, Bad Witch. It's an album connected to a three-piece concept, ultimately connecting with the Not The Actual Events EP from 2016 and the Ad Violence EP from last year. As Trent elaborated in a recent interview, the idea of this three EP thing was all to find truth in us figuring out who we are now and how we fit into the world. The first EP, not the actual events, was meant to be from a personal, angry, self-destructive reflection on that question. The second EP, Add Violence, was meant to the same question, but looking for answers externally. And the third EP, which has grown into an LP, it was coming to on a final look on that question from rejecting what EP number two says, that there wasn't an easy answer. The entire system has a much more bleak and pessimistic, uh, I don't want to say too much because it gives away kind of what the thing is. As you can see, the line between concept and non-concept on these albums are very vague. It seems like Trent has a lot of ideas and thoughts about what these albums are about, but as always, he doesn't want to reveal too much of it. And that's another beautiful and smart nuance about Trent and the art that he's creating. 
when he created Year Zero in 2007, he didn't only create a massive concept album that people would creatively engage with on the internet, he created a reputation for himself. He wasn't just the angry, misunderstood man that the music and the media has portrayed him as, all of a sudden he became a mysterious character living in an alternate world whose words were connected to a story. Now the genius of Trent comes into play with how he gives the character and the story away. He doesn't hesitate to give away clues. Lyrics, artwork and videos are all seemingly equal parts of the puzzle. But these clues are often obscure and vague. They never lead you to any specific answer, and the best case scenario being that they lead you to yet another clue. The fans want a concept, but Trent only gives a fraction of it away. And that scarcity is what leads fans to wanting more. You might say, man, he's just manipulating his fans to sell more albums. But I don't think it's that simple. I honestly think he's doing his fans a favor. When he doesn't give away all the information, it leaves fans wondering what will be next. They use their imagination to come up with possible stories, themes and images to fill in the gaps. And ultimately, the listener ends up with a much more personal experience of the music and the lyrics. This is the exact same experience Trent had when he was growing up and listening to artists like Pink Floyd and David Bowie. My experience as a fan, as a kid in Mercer, Pennsylvania, who's best friend was the record player yeah. outside of college radio airwave and way before the internet i learned about music i i would put on a record and i could relate to that song and it felt like that person knows how i feel and this is magic and i'm not alone and i've got it and i read between the grooves and i looked at the back of the record and i didn't know what pink floyd looked like i might have seen a picture in cream magazine or something but it didn't really matter right they were gods David Bowie was larger than life. He was an alien and he was fantastic. And I filled in the blanks as to what he was, you know, and whatever his real life was couldn't live up to what I projected he was and what his role was to me. Point is, I have grown to believe that I think that, um, trying to stay out of the limelight a bit, leave something to the imagination. I think an artist should be mysterious, in my opinion. The ones I've loved the most have had that element to it. Try to avoid the need to oversaturate yourself. You know, that's my take. As a conclusion, Trent knows for sure how to sprinkle whatever he does with a sense of mystery. That's an art that he's learned to use over the years. And it's something that not many artists use in an age where everything can be brought to light with a single search on Google. It's a rare virtue. And similarly to artists that I mentioned in the past, Trent never stops exploring new ways to create. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely looking forward to the new Nine Inch Nails album, his film scores, and hopefully a series in the future that is linked to one of his albums. Guys, I made some poetry last weekend, so I just want to share it with you, alright? Patrons, break down the door. You won't find the answers here, not the ones you're looking for. Except for David, he'll find the answers. Honestly, I don't know if this is poetry or if it's a joke by now, but yeah, never mind.